Good morning, everybody. It's Jakob from Deutsche. Or oh, good afternoon, rather. <laughs> Yes, we're getting at the end of the day here, Jakob. We don't see you on the screen, but I can hear you. Now I see myself. Can you see me now? Ah, there you are. Perfect. Hello. Hi. Hello, Jakob. Hi, Nana. Hi, Carl. Good morning. Hello, oh, sorry, afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon, evening, morning, everyone. It's so great to, to have the IGF vibe uh, again and, and have everyone here with us. And we're going to give it one more minute to see if anybody else still wants to walk through the door and everybody for find their seats. And then we're going to jump right through it. All right. I think we are ready here in the room in Japan. Glad to have all our online speakers as well with us as well. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Timur Schutte. I am Global Digital Policy Lead at the International Chamber of Commerce. Welcome to the session number 197, Operationalizing Data Free Flows with Trust, um, that the International Chamber of Commerce convened uh, at this um, IGF. It is a topic that we've heard a lot about already uh, in the past day and today, uh, and a lot more uh, in the past years, um, especially amid um, the global health, financial, and geopolitical crisis that we've been living through. Um, we've seen how these pose risks um, to the very functioning um, uh, of a rules-based multilateral system um, and acting policy frameworks that enable the open, interconnected, and interoperable nature of the internet has really proved essential. And, and we've talked a lot about that uh, in the past years. Um, trusted global data flows are really the engine uh, that moves the internet, that moves innovation, competitiveness, growth, and they are a powerful catalyst um, of socioeconomic empowerment. However, despite this agreement that we have around their usefulness and, and potential, um, we see a growing trend of mistrust uh, in cross-border data transfers. Um, and due to many various concerns, such as national security, privacy, or economic safety, um, and the fear that these very important goals could be compromised if that transcends borders. Um, and this increasingly fuels restrictive policies and measures like digital protectionism, data mercantilism, data localization, and others, which really deepen internet fragmentation, segregation, uh, segregating information that um, underpins a broad range of socioeconomic activities and undermining cybersecurity protection, for example. Um, unilateral policies such as this uh, exacerbate existing divides and, and may result in a patchwork of conflicting regulations, discouraging individuals, businesses, governments' participation in a global economy. What the International Chamber of Commerce has called for repeatedly is, is horizontal, interoperable, and technologically neutral policy frameworks um, that are really able to unlock the benefits of data while respecting fundamental human rights including the right to privacy and protecting public safety. This, in our opinion, would reinforce trust in cross-border data flows, boost data-driven innovation, and tap into that socioeconomic potential, uh, the benefits that data has to offer. So there have been notable developments that progress such frameworks that go against the grain of this fragmentation of the data policy um, space. Um, and, and there's one of them that is the most quoted these days uh, with no uh, coincidence that we are here in Japan is the data free flows with trust concept that uh, Japan coined um, a couple of years ago at the G20 summit. Um, other uh, elements that, that move towards this um, direction of, of enabling policy frameworks are the OECD's declaration on government access to personal data held by the private sector entities um, and uh, work uh, also in the G7 now to uh, operationalize the FFT with the establishment of the institutional arrangement for partnership. So there's a lot of work ongoing to, to try and, and set um, frameworks for, for data governance. Um, what we're trying to do today with the panel here and online is to try and make sense of some of these, um, try and think about uh, why uh, we are talking of data First, secondly, why we are talking about data flows, what are the potential here, what are some of the risks, 
um, and, and see how we move forward to truly uh, operationalize this concept of data free flows with trust. So with me today, online and here on the panel, I have a panel of experts that have dedicated a lot of time and thought to this topic. So uh, without any uh, further ado, let me introduce them real quickly and then we'll start the conversation. Um, so first we have with us um, online, Ms. Nena Nakwama, board member of International Digital Health and AI Research Collaborative. Then sitting to my right, Ms. Sheetal Kumar, Head of Global Engagement and Advocacy at Global Partners Digital. Uh, to my far left, Mr. Raul Echeverria, Executive Director, um, Latin American Internet Association. Online with us, Mr. Carl Gamberg, Director of Policy Development and Research at the Internet Society. To my far right, Mr. Dave Pendel, Assistant General Counsel, Law Enforcement and National Security uh, at Microsoft. Um, to my left here, uh, Ms. Marit Paloverta, uh, Senior Director of Regulatory Affairs at the European Telecommunications Network Operators Association. Um, and uh, online with us uh, as well, uh, we have uh, Mr. Jakob Greiner, Senior Vice President, sorry, uh, <laughs> Vice President, not senior yet, Vice President for European Affairs at Deutsche Telekom. Thank you so much, Jakob. So to start off our conversation, um, I'm going to turn to um, first to four of our speakers um, and ask them um, to think about um, what are the commitments that we've had uh, on cross-border data flows and how, would, um, how are we looking into some of these risks um, and fragmentations that, um, that threaten those commitments that we've had uh, for, for um, maintaining data flows. Um, what I'd like our, our speakers um, really to, to talk a little bit about is um, sharing their views, uh, what, ha what steps have been taken so far um, to operationalize cross-border data flows and what are some of the necessary principles um, to enable this. Um, we have um, a lot to go through, so without further ado, I'm going to turn first to Nena to discuss the importance of data flows and their implications uh, in the development context. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Timia, for having me. Um, so I love to use illustrations uh, they, they make things come come alive for us. Um, so for those of you who traveled, you are in Kyoto. And when we're talking about data flows, it is not very different from traveling. So you book a flight, you get to the airport, you go through security, you hop on the plane, you trust that you will arrive at your destination, which most of you have. And it is in the arrival of everyone that we can have these and other, this and other sessions. And we enrich ourselves for the whole week, and we each go back to the airport, take our flights, go home, and continue the work. So my visual illustration of data flows is actually the same as human flow. So flows follow flows and data flows is not very different from human flow or what we call human mobility. Now, why is this very important to me sitting in Abidjan in West Africa today? The, the, the one thing that is important to me is that there is revenue involved. There is money to be made. And this is like Timia said in her opening speech, it is about growth, it's about growing economies, it's about growing people, growing countries, growing continents. And as an African, this is very, very important to me. So data flows for me uh, is first of all, uh, a human development issue. The, this, the other point is in the SDGs, we, we all recall that uh, when we were fighting for these, we said data was at the basis of the SDG, data was a product, data was a driver, and all of that. So we cannot reach our development goals without data. That one is a, is a principle that the whole world has accepted. And while we are working on these principles, that is where our session today comes in. How do we operationalize this? I come from IDA, the International Digital Health and AI Research, and everyone knows that um, AI uh, is built on data, and if we don't have data, we cannot function, whether it's in, in its research. Now, applying this to health 
is really very important to me. We have the principles of data anonymization. I do agree. So as either our whole raison d'etre is built on cross-border cross data flows. And I, I want to submit that, that uh, in many developing countries, we actually need data in agriculture, we need data in education, we need data especially in health. And if data doesn't flow, it's like people don't come. So um, for me, uh, data flows are very important uh, in critical areas of development. Now, operationalizing it is why we are here. The principles, the understanding. So I'm speaking to people who are travelers and I want to come back uh, to my initial illustration. We all know that International Air Travel Association exists. It is not run by government alone. There is someone here from law enforcement. There is someone here from the network operators. The, the network operators are like airline operators, right? And, and then there is this, the guy who will check you in, who is just the, low, the national security person, right? And there's the other one who will stamp your passport when you arrive make sure everything is in order. It's a whole ecosystem out there. And that is why it is important that we agree. It is not a government only issue. And that is my biggest uh, submission today, Timia. Um, I know that some governments have challenges with the internet and how it is built and how it runs. And I want to bring them back to the point that you should not be afraid. We can build trust together. Despite the fact that governments alone do not run IATA, uh, the, 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 the aviation business still grows. Governments still get their taxes. People like me still get my miles. And you all get your photos with the, with the pilots and all of that. And we all come to Kyoto, enrich ourselves and go home and keep enriching ourselves. So here are my submissions. I know my minutes are few, but please let's understand that flows follow flow, that data flows are like human mobility. We can call it data mobility. And that this is revenue creation. It is in moving, it is in confronting, it is in being used that data gets value. And this movement, this free flow of data, having it in a trusted environment is, is of use to every single one of us. But it is even more critical for people like me in developing countries, for someone like me in digital health, for someone like me in AI research. Thank you very much for having me. I'm glad that I can participate online and I'm happy that I can contribute to the flowies. Thank you. Thank you, Nana. This was a very inspiring, and thank you for bringing it down to very clear comparisons. I think it's uh, sometimes when we talk about data flows, it's become so esoteric, uh, and you really made that uh, relatable. So thank you for that, uh, and thank you for for um, sharing the perspective uh, also from from the from your home country and, and your own experience um, that sometimes is so missed uh, in some of these conversations. Um, and thirdly, thank you for, for making it clear um, that trust is based in dialogue and cooperation. I think we take good note of that. Um, Shita, uh, Nena mentioned uh, getting back to the, the basics and, and, and make sure that uh, operationalizing data free flows really reiterates some of the principles that we all committed to. Um, what are your, your views on that? And, and what are the, those commitments, the baseline principles that you think we should all make um, to uphold data flows? Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Tamea. It's good to be here and um, to talk about a topic that is um, embedded in so many of the discussions that we're having at the Internet Governance Forum. Um, I wanted to highlight two points which I think are cross-cutting and important when it comes to principles. One is uh, the importance of a human rights-based approach um, and the second is the need to um, address uh, 
uh, trends such as data localization um, and the types of measures uh, that you mentioned earlier, um, sovereignty, etc., that lead to um, or that stem from mistrust um, and that also affect uh, human rights-based approach. And then finally, I wanted to touch upon one um, point which I think we aren't seeing reflected enough, perhaps in principles, uh, which is about equitable access um, to, to data. Um, so on the first point, um, of course, there we do need to recognize that there is a difference between personal um, data, non-personal data, and I know that fellow panelists will speak to, to some of that, but either way, um, frameworks that uh, are underpinned by human rights principles will create um, and enable clarity and, and, and protection of data that is so critical for trust. Um, and that's why I think data protection legislation um, embodies, of course, a lot of the, the principles um, that we, we require that need to be implemented effectively um, uh, when it comes to personal, personal data. Um, and for that reason, all cross-border data sharing agreements um, ref should reflect and, and must reflect human, human rights standards. But on this point, I think one of the um, areas that perhaps we're not seeing enough engagement um, with, uh, with different stakeholders is on, on, um, on the topics of data governance, particularly in some parts of the world where perhaps these discussions are more difficult to access, expensive um, to engage with. Um, and I just wanted to note that um, colleagues from Consumers International, and I know some of them are here, held the Day Zero event um, yesterday where they were addressing some of these discussions and reflecting the need for more digital rights and civil society and consumer groups to be involved in discussions relating to cross um, to data governance more generally. And that also is important to look at the full process. So while data, the framework um, that you've mentioned, data free flow with trust, um, considers legal mechanisms, it's important to also consider um, what happens after data flows when it's stored, you know, the whole life cycle and how consumers um, can ensure that their rights are respected throughout that life cycle. And you mentioned the um, institutional arrangement for partnership, which uh, is looking to operationalize um, the, the framework. That's an example of where I think it's very important to reflect the role of civil society in that. And there is a, there's a nice infographic on the website um, that you can, you can access, and there are different stakeholders illustrated there, but uh, civil society, I think, still needs to be reflected in that. Um, it is missing at the moment. But data localization, I mean, this is something that in the data free flow with trust um, framework is recognized to be a barrier, of course, to, to data flows. And it stems from various different, uh, uh, well, um, different reasons are given for data localization. But as it shows, um, the World Economic Forum paper on, on, the, on the framework um, shows that whatever the reasons that are provided um, for, for uh, requiring forcing data localization, so forcing um, data to be stored in servers in country, it doesn't have the effects um, that, it, that is uh, supposedly intended, which is growing the local economy. It actually has um, detrimental effects to the local economy and in fact can lead to um, um, surveillance um, and, and the harming of, of, of uh, rights um, in country as well. So finally, I know I'm running out of time. I just wanted to point to the, and I think Nana maybe made a mention of this, the importance of recognizing that data, and this might sound controversial, maybe I should start with this, data in and of its, data is not valuable in and of itself. It, it, you need to make it valuable, you need to interpret it, analyze it, um, and do something with it for it to have value. And that requires broader infrastructure. So um, it requires, of course, technical um, knowledge and capacities, broader physical infrastructures and knowledge um, infrastructures, and that is not um, always the case. And so you need to invest in that. Um, and in some parts of the world, there is an equitable access to data um, and an ability for civil society and researchers to make use of data for health, um, for you know, reasons and, um, and in other industries and sectors as well. So that needs to be addressed. So let me stop there and I'm happy to pick up some of those points later. Thanks so much, Sheeta. That was a lot that you managed to pack it in the, in the small amounts of minutes that we've allotted you. Um, but thank you for, for bringing it full, full circle, of making sure that we know we, why we want to talk about data and really what creates the value um, of data. Um, linking it back into um, what is it, it, what is its potential, but also reminding us that we need to commit to 
making this work and making that a usable um, and, and making sure that it respects um, all kinds of expectations that, that we have to it and that includes really having everyone around the table. Thank you for that. So now with these reminders of, of what is the value of data and what are the commitments that we need to have in place to, to make use of that value, um, I want to turn to my next two panelists and talk a little bit about the risks that we face if we don't do that, if we don't make these commitments. So um, Raul, Nena has mentioned some of the developmental risks here that we are facing. Um, but um, what is your perspective um, sitting at, uh, at the helm of ALAI um, and some of the risks that we might have from an economic or governance perspective if, if we don't make this commitment? Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak at this panel with uh, so distinguished uh, uh, colleagues. Um, I, I was thinking on the, I, I like the analogy of uh, Onena that uh, with the aviation system and the and I was thinking that I, I have suffered uh, a, a few flight cancellations in the last few months. So maybe that could be the equivalent to internet shutdowns. Maybe. <laughs> and, uh, but the, uh, I think that many people speak uh, about, uh, that uh, speak, uh, say that, that uh, we are living in an economic uh, 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 database economy. And, I think that this is not totally true. It's not uh, co completely true. So we are living in a in a database society. Not uh, everything is based on, that, on data, as uh, as uh, Sheetal and Nena said before. And uh, is all the, the the every uh, public and private services that people access to are based on data. And I'm speaking about uh, health services and government services, but also marketplaces and e-commerce and everything, but, but sometimes we think that it's only, that data is only a problem that uh, has to be with, uh, has relation with, uh, with uh, internet platforms or marketplaces, but, uh, but data is everywhere. Uh, so that's the reason why we need the data to, to flow uh, almost freely and uh, that uh, to enable that uh, those services are available for everybody and create benefits for everybody in the world. And obviously, there are rights to be protected, and so I agree with Sheetal about the, the, the human rights uh, uh, approach. Uh, this is very important, and this is why we need uh, legal frameworks to, to ensure that the, the data transfer and data flow is, uh, is secure, but and create the conditions to, to, for that uh, safe uh, data flow, but not the contrary. That's the objective of the public policy. That should be the objective of the, not to block the, the data flow, but to create the safe conditions, uh, the, the, the appropriate environment for ensuring that the, the, the data is, uh, is, uh, is being available in the, uh, in the, in the way to, but that is needed, but protecting the, 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 the rights of the people. The, the, oh, the free data flow should be the norm, not the not the exception. And, um, but the, to to ensure that secure the data flow, the secure flow of data is important. Uh, to to have a, a good, we need to have good local policies, but also interoperable and uh, regional and, and and global approaches. Uh, what uh, we we are uh, witnesses is is that the. There are different kind of policies that imposes uh, restriction to the to the flow of data, uh, and so creating restriction for people to to be benefited with the uh, digital uh, development. And the, sometimes are very specific policies like data protection policies that uh, when we discuss, there is is very common that there is some uh, that people misinterpret uh, policy makers misinterpret what is uh, uh, an international data transfer, for example, and uh, and. That some people think that is uh, like a, a box with the data that I'm sending through DHL to somebody else, and so we need to block this kind of transfer, so except that there are um, um, uh, agreements and, and consent from the from the people. But, but for example, think as when we are coming to Japan and we are trying to uh, to book a hotel uh, uh, from my country. I book a hotel in Japan through a platform that is incorporated in a country in Europe, but is using a, a payment platform that is based in the United States. And so the, the, 
the, the data is, 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 is flowing through uh, the companies and that's our, our, our uh, are based in different jurisdictions, but it's always a part of the same contract of services. So the, and it's, it's difficult sometimes to explain to policymakers this concept. And so based on good faith, but trying to protect the rights of the people, but so the, the, sometimes it, the policies impose restriction to that flow. And we are dealing in this, at this moment, we are dealing with this, exactly with this case in at least three countries in Latin America. But sometimes it's other kind of, of policies that, that has nothing to do with, apparently, with that transfer. But uh, policies that deal with the, uh, at the infrastructure level, or even taxes, or content moderation, but or uh, 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 law proposals that, uh, that include the possibility to block applications in, in some conditions. And so that's creating a, a very fragmented internet. And it's clear that a fragmented internet is the perfect scenario to block the data flow because it's impossible to, to it's like to cross a river without a bridge or without a boat. That's a, so the, uh, I think that's the, w the, one of the problems that we have to work, uh, or one of the challenges is we have to work much more with, the, with, the, with policymakers and uh, to, to trying to get uh, to, to achieve a better understanding of those concepts, data flow, fragmentation. Uh, but we have also to work with uh, among all the stakeholders, not only with governments. And we need uh, two more points. We need models to evaluate and to an and analyze the, the impact of, of proposals, uh, policy proposals, data flow and, and, and fragmentation. And I think that's the last one is we need a strong commitment the, among all stakeholders to not promote policies uh, from uh, each uh, stakeholder group or to not promote policies that uh, potentially could lead to, to fragmentation just because uh, this is uh, aligned with the interests of one specific group. So the, uh, I think that's, uh, those three uh, points are what I, I leave to, for people to so for feeding the discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Raul, um, and, and thank you for um, noting that very complex policy space. Um, and, and really, what we have to take away from it is, is to look at uh, policy measures and our and our um, thinking around uh, data, but also other matters that might impact data in a in a holistic fashion, um, in an ecosystem view, to make sure that uh, we hear uh, from everyone and we don't inadvertently have consequences when we don't intend to have them. Um, still on this topic of trying to figure out. Um, some of the risks that we are uh, seeing uh, around uh, fragmenting the policy, uh, technical governance, economic space uh, around data. Um, I'm turning to, to Carl online um, to share a couple of his thoughts uh, on what are the technical risks uh, in fragmenting the policy space around data governance. Thank you very much, and, and first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to this panel. Um, I, I regret I won't be, I'm not able to be there on site, but I'm really looking forward to the conversation here and also to follow the, the rest of the discussions this week. I think uh, kind of a useful starting point to think about data flows and conversely the risks of technical fragmentation is to kind of recognize that when we talk about the internet and why it's been so successful, uh, it doesn't only come down to kind of specific technologies that you might hear about. It doesn't only come down to technologies like packet switching or even the internet protocol. It, it really also includes how you make use of those technologies, how you puzzle them together, how you operate them, uh, how you, uh, you know, allow them to evolve and so forth. So, you know, one of the reasons why we're uh, talking about internet governance, for instance, and, and the importance around the management of the TNS or IP addressing or the value of open standards development is that they're not just sort of quote unquote nice to have, they're really kind of intrinsic to this model of networking that we have in the internet and what's made it so successful. So that's also why at the Internet Society we tend to talk about the internet exactly like that. We talk about it as a way of doing networking. That is, a, it's a model of how you do networking. And seen from this perspective, uh, the internet has some networking features that in themselves kind of contribute to this operationalization of, of uh, cross-border data flows. And they're inherently linked to principles. So from a technical point of view, these principles help ensure that you have a infrastructure that is 
you know, extremely accessible, that it's extremely efficient in terms of expanding connectivity and you know, by extension data flows, both within and across borders. So for example, a very kind of simple principle in the internet, uh, but that is extremely efficient is that, let's say that you're a new network that would like to join the internet, then all you really need to do is to negotiate a interconnection with one other network that is part of the global internet. And that allows your network to also be part of the global internet. So it's kind of this magical feature that you only really need one interconnection to one network and suddenly you have connectivity, global connectivity to, to everywhere in the world and by extension data flows uh, all across the world. So that's really important principle in the internet that sort of help operationalize global data flows. Um, but another important piece of this is that, you know, the internet is built to evolve. Uh, it's, it's really good at adapting and evolving over time. And, and this really comes down to this principle about using open standards and having an open architecture in the internet, because you can kind of upgrade the internet over time. You can take bits and pieces of the internet and you can improve them without having to tear down the whole thing and build it up again. No, you can sort of upgrade bits and pieces of the internet along the way as you see the need evolve. And we've actually seen this, this important principle um, play a big role in ensuring cross-border data flows with trust uh, specifically. Uh, and this relates to what happened about a decade ago when uh, I'm sure people are familiar with the Snowden revelations and the, the revelations that brought awareness to systemic uh, surveillance of internet communications. And as some might remember, this provoked like a very strong uh, reaction from the internet community in, in all parts of the internet community, of course, uh, but including amongst governments that wanted to restrict uh, data flows across borders. Uh, so for instance, there were some governments at the time that even wanted to prevent traffic from traversing networks in the United States and to interfere with a routing system to prevent these cross-border data flows. Now, of course, this also provoked a, a reaction in the internet's technical community that, uh, that took great efforts at strengthening the internet and to prevent these types of, of uh, attacks on the internet. And the ITF even uh, adopted some uh, new guidance in its, its uh, standards development processes where pervasive monitoring of this kind that was revealed in the Snowden revelations is to be understood as a technical attack towards the internet and that the ITF community should try to mitigate uh, those types of risks in the design of protocols. So this was kind of enabled through this open architecture because the community could upgrade the existing technologies by uh, adding security, notably in the form of encryption to ensure that you could have a, a greater, greater trust in, in data flows and, and notably cross-border data flows. Now, the reason why I'm, I'm sort of bringing up these two cases and the links to these principles is that we're seeing threats to the internet right now, which are, they could result in internet fragmentation. They're targeting precisely these two principles that I just mentioned, uh, the, the internet's accessibility and the ability to facilitate these cross-border data flows, but also the ability to secure data flows through encryption. So on the one hand, for instance, we see an extremely worrying trend in countries like South Korea and the EU and India and Brazil, where there are policy discussions about imposing regulations that would require online services to uh, pay large telecom operators a so-called network usage fee. So this would effect be a new form of termination fee that would be imposed on the network. And not only would this, of course, violate net neutrality, the principle of net neutrality, it would also uh, sort of undo the, the fantastic progress that we've seen in many of these countries over the past decade in terms of promoting safeguards for the free flow of data through net neutrality rules. But importantly, it also kind of violates this important principle about the internet, about the, the reachability and the accessibility of the network. And, and for those who haven't seen it, I would really recommend the Internet Architectural Board actually wrote a contribution to the EU's consultation on this topic, highlighting exactly this and how these types of regulations could violate these principles around accessibility and cause internet fragmentation. But we're also seeing, of course, on the other hand, um, this threat towards securing data in transit. So we see a very worrying trend where governments are now trying to prevent the use of end-to-end -end encryption, for instance. So the very technology that kind of helped enable continued cross-border data flows in the wake of the Snowden revelations 
is suddenly under threat and at risk of being outlawed in so ju some jurisdictions. So it's not it's not hard to see how this would impact cross-border data flows, where the technology that enabled continued flow of data in the wake of a, a harsh uh, attack on the trust of the network, namely through surveillance, how the prohibiting of, of such use of a technology and the prohibiting of an open architecture, in fact, would in turn translate into limiting cross-border data flows. So I think when we're talking about kind of policy frameworks uh, for, for the future, we also must recognize that there are existing ones that we should also highlight and that are important to preserve, like net neutrality, for instance. But also that there are principles in the internet around this open architecture uh, that are extremely valuable to also have recognized. So that's why we at the Internet Society also advocate for this idea of doing impact assessments kind of to what, to what uh, Roel mentioned, where you would take a look at the internet, kind of what you would do in the environmental space, but you do the same for the internet and you think through what are the consequences of some of these policies and what policies are actually helpful in terms of facilitating uh, cross-border data flows. But I'll stop there and I'll, I'll uh, hope we can discuss more of this later on. Thanks so much, Carl, and, and thank you for taking us down to the basics of the internet itself and the technical functioning of the internet and reminding us um, that we need to take this ecosystem view in which all stakeholders or sectors of industry um, and really all actors, uh, policymakers, and all, uh, all of us around this room need to think about uh, what is it that we're trying to, to achieve, protect, um, and, and, and how we're working around those not to... Not to create consequences that none of us were intending to do. Um, so to, to make the bridge really between now, we've talked a lot about the value, the risks, um, what is it that we do to, to make this workable um, and, and bridge the conversation from here into actually operationalizing the FFT. Um, let's talk a little bit about these elements of trust that you've all sort of kind of revert, referred to already. Um, what is it that we need um, to have in place to mitigate some of these risks? Um, and, and, and how we move forward um, really to have those trustworthy environment that enables the data flow. So to start first on this, um, I'm going to turn um, to some of our industry speakers. Um, Dave, um, how do you see this from, um, from the Microsoft perspective and, and what are some of these causes and drivers of risks that we need to think about as we, as we aim to build trust? Thanks, Tamam. Um, so I sit on Microsoft's law enforcement and national security team, which is the team at Microsoft that receives uh, just over 50,000 requests from governments um, each year from around the world, um, seeking data pertaining to well over 100,000 users. Um, and this work, the handling third-party government requests for data, it is often at the center of this trust discussion, as we've already seen a bit. And technology providers, for better or worse, are often at this, the center or the crossroads of this debate between security and, and privacy generally. Um, and we do play a public safety role, I think an important one. Governments need to obtain certain data um, under appropriate circumstances to investigate serious crimes. I think most folks agree with that. Um, we also play, I think, also another important role as kind of a fundamental guardrail to ensure that requests for customer data are lawful, compulsory, um, and are consistent with fundamental rights, including the right to privacy. Um, but this balance between privacy and security is often in tension, and I think that's what often leads to a lot of mistrust. And to be blunt, really the fear of government access to data is, has emerged as a pretty significant threat to data free flow with trust. Um, and the reactions to that mistrust ultimately threatened the foundation of the internet itself. I mean, the World Wide Web now was governed by a web of often conflicting and increasingly restrictive uh, laws. Um, whether these laws are motivated by legitimate privacy concerns or legitimate sovereignty concerns or competition concerns, um, or a desire, as, as was mentioned before, to kind of maintain access to data in a country, either through data localization or attacks on encryption, um, the rules that govern lawful access to data around the world are increasingly resulting in a more fragmented internet. Um, and that presents some pretty significant risks, many of which have already been discussed quite thoroughly on this panel and at IGF um, uh, and across the world. Um, the loss of connectivity and leaving people in regions and countries behind and out of the digital transformation is probably the most significant one. 
The undermining of the global digital economy and the trillions of dollars in trade that's at risk, also very significant. Um, some cons you know, risks of fragmentation are probably less discussed. Uh, the, the risk to public safety, you know, most serious crimes have some connection to the internet. And governments, you know, generally, if they are, you know, rights abiding and rule of law governments, um, there's a legitimate need to seek certain data under appropriate circumstances to um, uh, kind of counter serious crime. Um, and cybersecurity, that was mentioned, I think, Tamayo, you mentioned that at the outset. Um, it's not often discussed, but the, the fragmentation of the internet is essentially putting blinders on um, to certain portions of the internet that um, cybersecurity professionals who are trying to detect and counter um, sophisticated cyber attackers aren't going to be able to see what's happening. And in fact, you know, at Microsoft, uh, I, think we, I think it's over now, 40 trillion signals a day through the uh, kind of a global threat landscape are analyzed every single day trying to detect the cyber threats and tell our customers and users um, if they've been compromised and prevent that compromise from happening. Well, again, when you put those blinders on, it has a pretty significant impact on cybersecurity. But in my view, this perceived tension between privacy and security, um, which is at the heart of this mistrust, is in many ways, in important ways, exists more in theory than in reality. And I say that because when governments sit down to discuss these issues related to lawful access, and these are tough issues, but when they sit down and they actually talk about what they do, they tend to agree, and they tend to agree on some of the basic rules of the road. And the OECD um, process, I think, just proved that. So the OECD process, which Japan was a ma major driver of, bringing together 38 countries in kind of pursuit of data free flow with trust, 38 countries sat down and they brought in their privacy experts and their national security and law enforcement experts, and they talked about what they do. And they came up with multiple principles from legitimate aims, the, you know, the, these authorities only need to be, can be used in pursuit of legitimate aims, it cannot be used to suppress dissent or go over um, after people because of their race or religion or other protected statuses. Um, prior approval, oversight, transparency, redress, you know, the governments tend to kind of follow, rights respecting governments tend to follow the same principles when seeking access to data. And this could be a blueprint for um, promoting the free flow of data generally. Um, we ultimately need more than shared principles. We need binding agreements, and there has been some progress in the last year on those as well. Um, data access agreements, um, the U.S. has been negotiating uh, several with different countries, including one in negotiation right now with the EU, along with the uh, EU-U.S. data privacy framework, also important. Last year's signing of the second additional protocol by over a dozen countries was a kind of a significant step forward. But looking ahead, we still need a lot more. It's clear we need interoperable, multilateral frameworks that reflect kind of the nuances, nuances of this debate. Um, and frameworks really that recognize, again, the legitimate need for governments to access data, at least certain types of data for public safety. Um, I don't just work it on policy at Microsoft. I'm on, in the compliance business as well. And just since sitting here, I've received emails and alerts that there have been emergency requests coming into our team. We have a team that staffs those 24 hours a day, every day of the year. There's a legitimate public safety need to respond to these kinds of requests when they're appropriate. Um, and significantly, the, the need for broader inclusivity, because a lot of those agreements I talked about are essentially transatlantic agreements and that leaves much of the world out of the picture. So that, that's one big area of need. And a framework that kind of reflects that trust is earned. You know, for data to fro, uh, flow freely, there must be adherence, to, again, to rights um, protective standards and the rule of law. And that is really at the core here, because if you're not respecting the human rights of all of the users, then that framework is, uh, is woefully inadequate. So much has been accomplished, especially over the last year, but much more remains to be done. Thank you so much for that, that reminder uh, and, and setting out some of the goals that we should be striving to. Um, you've talked a lot about, uh, we've all talked a lot about data, haven't really made a distinction between data uh, that is personal, data that is non-personal. There are obviously very different risks um, uh, attached to, to either or the, uh, the other, and then neither of those um, are really monoliths in themselves. So there's a lot of nuance to unpack here. We won't endeavor to do all of this in this panel, um, but uh, I will ask the next two panelists to focus on some of the different uh, elements of this. Um, so Marit, I'm turning to you next. Um, as we're talking about the trust that we need, what is it that we need to 
uh, attach, uh, what are the elements of trust that we need to attach to global data flows when we talk about um, privacy protection and protection of personal data? Okay. So uh, thank you, Tim. I'll um, try and <laughs> respond to the exact angles that, that you're asking, but um, uh, thankfully we also have Jakob uh, after myself who can maybe then uh, uh, complement. Um, so maybe I'll just uh, frame a little bit from, from the telecoms operator's point of view, because indeed we heard a lot of things already and, and many of the buzzwords were already uh, mentioned. But if you think about data, data traffic, of course, I mean, uh, you know, the, 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 all this data traffic is really underpinned by the networks and who runs the networks, whether it is the telecom operators. So, of course, for, for, for the companies that uh, we at Etno represent, this is really the bread and butter um, uh, of our everyday work. And there's a lot of innovation happening at the moment, a lot of things changing in, 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 in the way of um, data traffic patterns, etc. So there's a lot of talk about virtualization, cloudification, you know, 5G, and, and all of this is great, but what it means that the way that data is, is moving in the networks is changing. And also the fact that now data is being stored, not so much in the center, but more on the edge, means that the, 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 well, the linkage between the, the device and the edge computing, that is also becoming different. And um, then, of course, with, with all of this, uh, we also need to look at the cross-border uh, collaboration aspects as, as data, of course, needs to move globally. So um, to, in order to provide telecom services at a global level, Operators need collaboration with vendors, with partners, with different kinds of providers. And uh, in fact, with this virtualization, the role of these uh, third-party providers uh, just increases. And then if you add on top of that, I think it was Nena who mentioned AI, uh, IoT, that are these are new technologies that are really uh, powered by troves of data. So then we are really looking at uh, more and more traffic and also then more and more kind of uh, cross-country traffic. So then moving to the, the, the policy framing and especially uh, the, the privacy issues. So in the past years, and I, I guess the European Union in a way was a kickstarter here because uh, the, the GDPR happened, um, I think it was 2018 and uh, well, for better or worse, you may argue, we don't want to be judging here, but, um, but um, well, this, this new framework provided stability in Europe, but also then made somehow a, a global model, if you like, uh, for, for uh, a, a regulatory framing for privacy issues. And of course, there are different variations, but there was a kind of a wave of other uh, regulatory um, uh, procedures and processes elsewhere in the world, in Africa, South America, Asia, etc. And while you may say whatever you like about the privacy regulations, I think that one thing is clear is that these new regulatory developments actually have improved trust and confidence among citizens. And we should also keep in mind that, of course, uh, the, the internet is only used for as long as people feel that it's trustworthy. So, so there is a, you know, we are trying to here find a balance between, on one hand, innovation and, and the economic activity, but also then with privacy. And um, it needs to be a balanced approach. Um, and this has been a, traditionally, of course, a European point of view. Um, but um, uh, we also think that that could be interesting uh, to, to other parts of the world. And then, you know, if you now think about the regulatory discussions that are happening, well, very much here in Japan as well, but elsewhere in the world in parallel on artificial intelli intelligence and, and data governance, there is, in our view, also need to establish common basis uh, to promote some kind of regulatory coherence and simplification on a kind of global scale. So I think it's maybe not realistic to say that we will have exactly the same thing everywhere, but, but that there is some level of interoperability between regulations so that we actually have a kind of a functional uh, regulatory framing for, for private sector parties as well and, and for businesses. Um, on the internet fragmentation, there was already a lot of talk. I mean, you know, just maybe to say and, and to link back to these policies that, um, well, you, if you look at it only from that point of view, you can of course say that there's a risk for fragmentation with, this, with these policies if everybody, you know, uh, implements a different type of policy. 
But then we should keep in mind, as I already mentioned, that these policies also often have a positive impact on the internet, for example, increasing trust. So we should be a little bit, um, you know, mitigated the way we look at these issues because they often have two facets. Of course, I mean, going into Carl's comments on, on open standards, I mean, I think many people and most people agree, and us included, I mean, this is the starting point for an open internet, and, and there is uh, no need or, or you know, it's, it would be risky to start uh, meddling with that. Then we can look at commercial practices, which is often debated as well, and... Um, Net neutrality came up. I mean, again, Europe, I mean, it's one of the few places where we do have a regulation on the open internet, um, which ensures free flow of traffic. And this has been the case uh, quite a long time now. And well, now we hear that the US is again starting the discussion um, on that same topic as well. Um, so, so there can be also bis business practices, I guess. We talk sometimes about walled gardens, you know, this type of uh, environments that also could then cause uh, fragmentation on the either connectivity side but also on the, on the content side. So then looking at the, you know, way forward, and, and Timia, you mentioned at the beginning some, some key words, and, and I have to be boring but only to agree in that we, we also uh, believe that, um, you know, uh, the, the, the kind of good balance and whereby we promote innovation and including things like global digital commerce. However, then we also kind of keep the rights and values uh, in the background is best achieved through a regulatory framework that is horizontal, so not sector specific, flexible, interoperable, and also technologically neutral. And as already as well said, so we need to also then see how we can promote cooperation and broadening of the jurisdictional horizons um, in order to make sure that the interoperability then uh, factor is, is well, somehow, uh, well, clearer and, and also practical. And from a European perspective, of course, so uh, just to go back to David's comments as well, so the European policymakers have started agreeing, making loads of data, kind of data free flow area um, um, agreements uh, between several countries, not only the US, but also Japan and South Korea. And from private sector's perspective, this is really great because it provides regulatory certainty. And, um, and we would also then encourage our policymakers in Europe to expand these agreements and make sure that they also then come to the other parts of the world, such as Asia, Latin America and Africa. So. I'll, I'll stop there, thank you. Thanks so much, Marit. Um, and yes, I don't want to repeat your points because we agree on a lot of things uh, and, and, and uh, time is also short. Um, but I will turn to our, our, our last panelist um, for this segment um, and, and uh, we're staying in Europe, we're actually moving to Europe because we're gonna have uh, Jakob join us online. Um, if you'd like to build on, on what Marit said and what, what Dave as well, um, on building these elements of trust um, and maybe if I can ask you to focus a little bit of uh, non-personal data uh, transfer sharing and, and the flow of non-personal data and what are the elements of trust that we need to attach to that. But of course, feel free to, as Marit set you up, to add to whatever the points that she, she said earlier. Okay, thank you, Timir. I hope you all can see and hear me and the internet is working well. Um, I, I really liked how uh, Nena set the stage with her uh, airplane um, flight routes uh, introduction, and I'd like to come back to that maybe occasionally in my next five minutes. Um, just to say, first off, I think this whole panel shows that um, we all agree that uh, data flows are, are super important to tackle some of the most pressing challenges today, be it environmental, economic, health, safety, but also uh, 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 economic uh, challenges. I think Nema said money needs to be made and is being made with data flows, I fully agree. Uh, the question that I would like to raise, um, being also an operator that is very much European centered, but also has uh, a global footprint and being present in the US, uh, is is uh, the money or is the data flow fair distributed today uh, in our internet ecosystem? Um, and uh, to, to start talking about data flows, I think first we need to take a look also at um, the internet ecosystem of today. Um, the free flow of data has for long been the very essence of the internet, uh, but I would also say it's safe to say that over the past years, uh, this architecture and our view has also changed uh, quite fundamentally, and these changes have also an impact on the way data is being used and transferred. 
what, have I, what, what do I mean by that? And I give you an example of, of the EU in the US where, I'm, I'm, where we are present uh, on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, when you look at today where uh, global internet traffic runs, uh, then uh, it's almost 70% running through uh, the proprietary networks of uh, a few companies. Uh, these companies have actually uh, gradually expanded their own private infrastructures, their terrestrial networks, their backbones. You, you could basically more or less say they are like a private airport while telecom operators are the public airport. And the difference is that the public airport is uh, subject to a lot of rules and, uh, and regulation while the private airport uh, doesn't have the same regulation. Although we are all basically huge airports uh, connecting uh, the world. And this is a, a disbalance that I think needs to be um, taken into account uh, when looking how uh, data flows are today globally um, flowing. Second, when it comes to the distribution of global data flows, and again, here, taking the EU-US uh, example, we are our largest partner when it comes to data flows, but the distribution is unfortunately rather one-sided. So it somehow seems the planes from Europe are starting flying across the US, but they're somehow not coming back. Over 90% of EU-based companies send data to the US, and that uh, is great for the US, but uh, it's not so great for the competitiveness and innovation that is happening in Europe. I'm just describing a status quo. I'm not saying you know, where the, where the, the flaws uh, are, but, but that's uh, a fact that I think needs to be taken into account when we're talking about data flows being an economic driver. Um, we just see it's rather one-sided than reciprocal. Uh, and then um, I would like to come to what Timia asked me <laughs> to answer, which is uh, the notion of trust. Uh, of course, coming from, from Europe, uh, trust and security is essential and uh, there is no, and there should not be any data flow uh, if uh, trust and security are undermined. We have seen um, that Europe has over the past years developed quite a dense regulatory framework to ensure that uh, citizens, public bodies, but of course also companies can rely on the protection of their data. And what started with the GDPR and the protection of personal data is more and more moving now also uh, towards uh, safeguards for sensitive non-personal data, trade secrets, uh, intellectual uh, property, uh, such as by the uh, recently adopted EU Data Act. And we welcome that because um, yeah, trust for companies is not only perceived to, to uh, lie within personal data, but of course also non-personal data. A good example where um, you could clearly see that there's a, globally, I think, a need to balance legitimate security concerns um, with the free of, uh, flow of data is, uh, is the, the recent, what is it now, the third, the fourth attempt to have uh, a stable um, US-EU uh, privacy uh, framework agreement uh, so that uh, companies can exchange data based on, on an equal level of data protection. I think that's that's something very welcome from a perspective also of uh, a European uh, company. But I think now it is very important that the implementation of this framework shows its teeth, uh, that, uh, for example, the, the restrictions to the access of uh, data by security uh, and intelligence uh, agencies on the US side is now really happening based on these agreements. Uh, and by that, um, I think we, we can see that there is a balance reachable between legitimate security concerns, concerns but at the same time also uh, the free flow of data. And then let, let me move lastly to, um, to the area of cloud, because I think Margaret said it before, in, in the whole internet, the whole uh, economic activity globally is moving in more in a, in a virtualization, cloudy, cloudification uh, um, uh, atmosphere. And uh, uh, if we're looking at... Um, the cloud policy that is happening uh, at the moment in Europe, some might say, well, as, as uh, David said, this could lead to fragmentation. This is, you know, rather almost protectionist what's happening because uh, data flows are being restricted. Uh, restricted. There is localization happening, um, but it's happening for a cause where we believe this is actually not against uh, the free flow of data principle. It actually uh, um, provides the security and trust that is needed so data flows are happening. What do I mean with that? Um, if you look today at um, the concerns of European businesses, almost 70% of cloud users consider that access to their data from outside of Europe is a risk. And that's why they are not putting their data enough uh, in, in the clouds of uh, cloud providers. And that is not, again, because of 
personal data only, but also because of industrial non-personal data. And so in our view, it's only consequent and right that data flows here are restricted and, uh, and, and localized. That is what the EU Data Act has been uh, aiming for. And that is also right now what the uh, current discussion around uh, cloud certification security scheme is aiming towards. So by that uh, increasing trust, increasing security, and by that in the end, ultimately leading to more global data flows, not less. So again, I think it's not uh, about, um, you know, uh, um, nations um, uh, like the European Union trying to somehow take a step in the different uh, um, direction, but it basically follows um, um, the need for more uh, trust and security when flows are happening. So to sum it up, um, I think it's vital that we, uh, on a global level, um, have a common approach to data flows, but building trust requires addressing an uneven distribution of data flows, as I described it. Uh, it also means the changed nature of the internet architecture needs to be taken into account, and also the need to ensure that um, effective protection of data, be it personal or non-personal data, um, uh, is happening, uh, where it is stored and where it is processed. And by that, uh, um, I think we all aim for the same uh, goal, um, uh, enabling data flows with trust. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jacob, and, and thanks for bringing the points really full circle and in, in, in pointing out that uh, fragmentation can happen from very different uh, aspects. Um, but also, if we don't step up our game and set policies that enable trust and policies that enable um, secure, trusted um, uh, data flows, uh, then we are going to end up in a situation where we have a, a patchwork of regulations that uh, actually go against the purpose of why we wanted them in place in the first place, <laughs> uh, which is to enable um, uh, digitalization, to enable data flows um, that drives the development uh, of our societies, of our economies, of our personal developments that we all, all uh, strive for. Um, we have gone a bit over time than what we planned for this first part of the, of the panel, and we did want to, uh, to give some time for the audience to ask questions. I received two questions online, um, and I'm sure there's some in the room. So while those of you who might want to have a, a question uh, uh, put your hands up or, or start lining up at the, at the microphone. I'm going to ask the panel the two questions that we, we received online. Um, one is about security, um, and, and one of our question askers is um, asking how we can ensure um, a state-of-the-art security to protect user data. Um, and the other question is uh, really around um, safety, trust, security as well, is how can we make sure that we, we don't end up with one specific um, group uh, or actor or stakeholder um, taking control uh, of, of data and what are some of the checks and balances that we can have around that. Um, so as people in the room think about if they want to ask a question, I'm gonna see if one of our panelists might want to respond to some of these questions around security. Shita. Okay, I, I was just saying, um, I think Carl made a good point earlier about security uh, and how both technical and legal measures are required to ensure that data is kept securely. One of the technical measures is encryption um, and whether it's data in transit or data being stored, um, it is really an integral part of um, a security infrastructure for data. And what we are seeing, um, I think that you spoke to, um, Carl, uh, is, and, and others here, um, is a misalignment sometimes, unfortunately, of different um, attempts to address different issues that are actually um, quite connected or because they're not aligned with a human rights-based approach end up doing more harm than good. Um, and one of the ways to address that is to definitely ensure that um, engaging with um, with all stakeholders and doing uh, and using tools like internet impact assessments or human rights impact assessments to assess whether uh, proposed measures are, are actually going to achieve the intended effect or 
or not, and what other options there are to proportionally and um, you know actually um, uh, do what what is intended um, instead of perhaps in the, with the aim of providing more safety. In the in the end, you actually create more insecure um, uh, technology. So that, that that I think was a key point uh, that was shared earlier, and hope um, responds to to the question. Thanks, Chita. You can mail. Senior. Yes, please, Nana. Yeah, on the second question of preventing biases and prejudices, I think that globally we have this, um, I don't know, I'm trying to use a, a word that is contained, a diplomatic word. We kind of beat our chest. We, we, have, we have this orthoglorification of saying once the EU uh, framework and the US framework agree, then the whole world agrees. I think that is, is not correct. The, the US is 300 million, the EU is about 450. That's 750 million out of 8 billion. That's less than 10%. And I do not think that we should follow in this very particular way, we should follow the way we do international travel, having uh, London, Paris, and New York be the, the hub of, of our lives. I think that we should fight against. The, the future of the world is in Asia. The future of the world is in Africa. Humans are the people who create data. And I think that uh, my, my own plea to ICC is that as we go ahead, we need to be mindful of the fact that EU-US does not mean global. That's just my point today. We've been doing it in travel. We've been doing it with visas. We've been doing it in, in many other flows. We should ensure that the internet and free data flows should not be an EU-US issue. Thank you. Thanks, Nana. And I think we have a good uh, a testimony <laughs> to, to the globality that if you would see the people who are lining up here to ask questions from the panel, um, uh, I hope that they will bring in some of that diversity of points of view that, that you're asking. So um, I'm going to ask um, all of you to put your questions up. Uh, I hope you will be brief, and then I will ask the panel to, to try and address them collectively. So I'll start here, then I go there, and then we go back and forth. Please. Right. OK, so I'm Daichi. Uh, I'm operator of the local IXP in Japan. So uh, I have. I would like to ask an opinion about uh, authority to verify the data flow or data itself is trustful or not. So if there is a possibility to establish new authority to verify the data flow or encryption is correct or not, so I would like to confirm this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Gentlemen over here. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, hi, I'm Javier Ruiz from Consumers International, and I think that uh, Shital was mentioning some of the um, results from our meeting yesterday with um, several consumer groups from the region and elsewhere. I think that the, um, the question that was raised was about what happens, not just when, how we send the data, but what happens afterwards. And I think for consumer trust in the, the trust in the DFFT, one of the things that we are finding is that consumers want to know that they can actually get redress if anything goes wrong, that it's not like a fire and forget, you know, which is what we see, in, unfortunately, in many situations when we look at uh, data free flows. So I w was wondering, how do you see this redress uh, working? And when we talk about operationalizing, how can we operationalize the redress in a way that generates consumer trust? Thank you so much for that. Jimson. OK, thank you very much. Great panel. My name is Jimson Olufi, Africa ICT Alliance. We we'll have a comment and a question. Uh, the first comment is with regard to the influence of GDPR with regard to data flow. And as Nena said, you know, data flow is not just about GDPR or EU and USA. Uh, but what we are seeing now is that the whole world is following the full step of uh, EU in that uh, regard. Uh, but we need data flow for business. I'm from business. So we need data flow or interoperability and then some form of, of course, control is very necessary. But EU should set the lead if they want it to be free flow indeed. Then number, uh, the question, that is to uh, Pedro. See, uh, I want to ask you, 
uh, how do you cope with uh, accessing uh, data that data is in the UIS, you know, UIS now based on GDPR is closed, okay? And how do you access it concerning your uh, need uh, for intellectual property protection and uh, attacks and what have you? Thank you. Thank you, please. Thank you, Masanobu Kato from Japan, uh, representing a private sector. And well, since we are you know, talking from uh, the private sector ICC, you know, point of view. I'm just wondering if uh, you have any ideas from business side to have a good solution on this. You know, we talked about uh, you know some commercial solutions uh, which may not be working right now, and uh, encryption is another technological you know questions which have some you know issues, for instance, for neutralities and so on, but. Uh, uh, in Japan, I you know, heard in some debate recently that the trust service can be a solution, well, maybe a local solution, or could uh, increase more localization, but uh, there are some thinking of, of this kind where you can, uh, you know, commercial uh, you know, sector or business sector can make an actual proposals. Are there any such activities or an initiative that an ICC or you have some ideas about this? Um, that's my question, thank you. Thank you very much. Please, madam. Hi, hello, Bernard Chalagur, I'm an academic. Um, I have a question regarding telecommunication systems. So a few years ago, the deployment of 5G um, technology led to a global crisis. And then we saw some submarine cables being rerouted or some submarine cable projects being um, canceled. Um, and then recently we saw that certain countries would not authorize satellite broadband services by Starlink, for example, because it's a um, US company. So my question is, do you see the data flow with trust schemes also de-intensifying these geopolitical tensions regarding the telecom global telecommunications infrastructure? So. Thank you, thank you for that. The gentleman over here. Uh, hello. Uh, I, so, sorry, we're sorry. just alternating microphones, so we're gonna go here first yes. and then I'll turn to you, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Shota Watanabe, working for a Japanese think tank. And my question is, uh, which forum would be better for operationalizing DFFT? Uh, because there are so many forums discussing DFFT. For example, uh, Prime Minister Abe mentioned World Trade Organization uh, when he started DFFT. And then we have a lot of uh, other organizations such as uh, uh, OECD, which deal with like uh, government access declaration. and. Oh, and the recent establishing, the Japanese government is now planning to establishing IAP as a new forum. So, w w what kind of forum would be better, and for how to how can we avoid the uh, you know the duplication of the debates among these forums? Thank you. Thank you so much. Please, sir. Hi, everyone. This is Narayan from Nepal. So when we talk about cross-border flow of data, uh, it's uh, very difficult to have some homogeneous regulation. And we have to think about the, uh, some common standard and principles in, in, the, in this con context. Uh, so uh, do you think that, uh, uh, like our title, uh, we should have some single free institution or forum, as he said, uh, which, which should work on the, this common privacy, security, and intellectual property sort of things. And uh, if not, uh, how the, the, the countries, developing countries uh, and economies like uh, US, EU, and uh, Japan should collaborate and work with uh, the uh, uh, developing and LDC uh, countries? This is my question. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you for everyone uh, for asking your questions. Uh, it's really great to see that in this huge room, all the input of our panel was not lost and it's really interaction. Uh, it's really strange looking at it. It's such a big room, but, but I'm glad that you're all here with us and, and engaged in the conversation. Um, so we've heard um, about six, seven questions here um, regarding um, you know, how, do, um, how do we make sure that uh, the trust is, is, is enabled uh, with the right authority and, and, and clarity and, and who can access and who can't. Um, um, questions around redressing pers um, 
having redress mechanisms for any uh, violations of rights, um, questions on how do companies cope uh, with such a fragmented environment, especially when they are required to, to provide that data for um, public safety reasons, um, questions on um, how do we uh, find commercial solutions, can we find commercial solutions on these challenges? Um, is there geopolitical tension that uh, risks to be uh, heightened? Um, is there a way to, um, where, which is the best forum to address some of these questions? Um, and, and how do we uh, include uh, LDCs, LLDCs in some of these conversations? So as I'm going to ask my panelists to share their final remarks from, from this conversation, um, I'm going to extend the one minute that we gave you uh, to two minutes and try and pick your question or pick some of the questions that were asked um, uh, and then perhaps uh, leave us with a lesson that you think we should uh, learn from, from today's conversation um, and, and the global state of play around data governance. I'm going to go on in the order that, that you all have spoken because some of you have been silent since you first spoken. So uh, I'm going to turn to, to Nena first if you want to pick one or two of these questions and share your last remarks. Well, thank you, Timia, and thanks everyone for your rich contributions. Um, I would love to speak to the duplication of forum uh, and where, where we should be having these conversations. Conversations are a great thing. Um, normative conversations are great, but legally constraining uh, conversations are more important. So the, my answer to that question would be, uh, let's have conversations in multiple places. Uh, let's have normative certain conversations at global level. But when it comes to decisions, let's make them firm so we can hold uh, stakeholders uh, responsible. And I'd rather that this will be done at a global level, most preferably under the UN umbrella, uh, because we've seen things. I'm speaking as an African, uh, speaking from West Africa at this time. I don't think OECD uh, should be the place to hold conversations that will be of global um, constraining value. So I, I'd rather that the WTO, the UN, and its related agencies be the places where we make these decisions, even while we have conversations. I think that is why we come to the IGF. That will be my submission. Conversations must continue at global level, at regional level, uh, uh, um, private partnerships, national levels. Let's have these conversations. Even within civil society, we have human rights issues that we can reflect on, think tanks. But then when it comes to global decisions, let's make them at UN level. Thank you. Thank and you, have Anna. a great evening. Thank you so much. And enjoy your rest of your day. Thank you for being here with us. Shita, your takeaways and maybe some responses to the questions we've been asked. Thank you. Uh, just to respond to the point about um, where you know where to have discussions, I think as Nana said, they are being had in various places, but not everyone can access them, um, and not everyone understands um, or is engaging with the different ways that these conversations intersect, um, whether they're around e-commerce, um, trade, da um, and data uh, flows, um, or data protection. Um, and you know the standards that protect data, the technical standards. So there does need to be um, much more, I think, openness and engagement from a wider range of stakeholders in these spaces, not necessarily the creation of new forums. Um, and what I would say as well is in relation to whether it's protecting personal data or non-personal data, which as we heard earlier, both obviously require strong levels of protection. What we would like, I think what we need to see and what we have in some cases is um, legal frameworks uh, that provide for that. We need to see them implemented and to respond to the point about remedy, um, we need to see the, the, um, what, what is provided for, the, the rights that are provided for, for example, in legal frameworks around remedy actually uh, uh, implemented. And um, a leveling up, but leveling higher, I think, to higher um, human rights standards or to, to human rights standards across the board. And that will allow for the trust, uh, which was, you know, we've been discussing, um, to, to manifest. Um, because if we have those high standards across the board, across jurisdictions, that will, will support the trust and enable free flow. And then finally, to that point that I made earlier about the importance 
of ensuring that we have the broader infrastructures in place for people to make use of data um, for more equitable access, which is particularly important as we're talking about artificial intelligence um, and harnessing that. Um, fundamentally, that's about data processing, right? So the ability to do that um, requires a wide range of capacities, and I think we, we need to, to pay attention to that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shita. Raul. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, I think that the, the, um, in his intervention, Jacob uh, brought some new issues to the discussion that probably we deserve uh, an, uh, an entire session to deal with. Uh, so I will just refrain to a few comments. But uh, uh, as I was going to say exactly what Nena said before about the, the, the fact that that uh, the war is much more than the United States and, and Europe. And I understand that some, in some cases the players, the holders could feel that there are unequal relations, but uh, the history is plenty and is still, unfortunately, plenty of unequal uh, relationships between uh, countries and regions. And coming from Latin America, I think that's uh, our relation with the, the history of our relation with Europe is plenty of uh, those uh, cases. Um, and while uh, that some people could think that the, there is no protectionism in the in the in some measures that are being discussed or, or, or promoted in Europe, uh, being seen from outside of Europe, they look protectionist. And this is exactly what I say before when I say that we have to be careful that that uh, that in good faith, when some stakeholders try uh, promote policies that, uh, in their views. Are, are good for fixing market failures or, or, or problems, we have to be very careful with the consequence that the, those, uh, those uh, policies uh, could, could bring to the, to the whole internet, not only for, for one country or one, or one region. So that we need a strong commitment among stakeholders that, uh, that uh, we, we will defend and work together for a not fragmented uh, internet. Uh, I agree very much with uh, what uh, uh, Marit said before about that the, the, uh, the good policies uh, bring certainty, certainty to the, uh, the and more security and, and and trust, and I agree very much with that. But the, the problem that we face that uh, is that it, not all the policies are good, and not all the proposals are good. And in the in in regions like Latin America, where we deal with uh, many different jurisdictions, uh, more than. The, than 30 countries in Latin America and the Caribbean together. Uh, and so every, every country promoting their own uh, different uh, policies. We have to be very careful because the risk of those policies creating chaos or, or negative impacts instead of uh, certainty is, 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 is very big. And um, coming back to the European thing, that's that the, the uh, one, one thing that we live in, in Latin America is that that there is a, 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 a huge tend to copy and paste uh, co uh, policies uh, from Europe, um, policies that could be good for Europe. Uh, I'm not arguing against that. Not necessarily are good for, for Latin America, and I guess that same happens with uh, Africa, but uh, with Africa, that I, I don't want to make an opinion on that. So the, we need uh, more, more work among, among all stakeholders, try, as I said before, try to promote the discussions uh, about uh, the, the concepts of, of uh, fragmentation, the importance of, the, of data flow, and need to uh, make the policymakers understand uh, what's, what is in risk in, in, the, in the policy development that somebody they are not aware of. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Raul. Just mindful of the time, we have about eight to 10 minutes for the rest of the speakers, so uh, I do encourage you to try and be uh, short with your, your answers. Um, we, we've had a lot of engagement from the floor and that is always good, but we need to manage the time as well. Um, Carl, over to you for some last considerations. Thank you, I'll, I'll try to keep it short, but I, I wanted to address something that I think address some of the questions that we received from the participants, or I think help address some of those questions, and that goes to really highlighting the importance of encryption and the continued support for the use of encryption, because a lot of the questions that I heard about, for instance, loaded data localization or the physical infrastructure and, or restrictions on interconnecting physical infrastructure, a lot of those challenges you can kind of resolve by allowing data to be encrypted, because it takes the locality or the, the importance of locality out of the equation. So for instance, um, I'm sitting in Switzerland. If my data is here in Switzerland unencrypted, 
then it's much safer on the other part of the world, other side of the world, if it's encrypted on that other side of the world. So locality uh, and, and sort of safety is not one-to-one -one when it comes to data, but it's rather making sure that you have the technical means to secure the data like encryption that is so important. And that also allows us to uh, have this global network if we can actually secure the cross-border data flows. Um, the other thing I wanted to address was the question around which fora to talk about this. And I think to Nena's point, the, uh, to ensuring kind of inclusiveness in these discussions are really important. I think in that regard, it's important to consider that all of the fora that we can think of have some form of barriers to participation. So I think it's important to actually allow these discussions to happen in multiple foras. And I'm not too worried about duplication of discussions as long as there is a path to a shared discussion. And I think the IGF system is actually quite good in that regard when you look at it in terms of national and regional IGFs that then sort of uh, is met with a crescendo of the global IGF every year. So I could, I could see the IGF structure coupled with other foras being actually very useful vehicles for for facilitating those discussions. And then finally, we had a question around sort of principles in, in uh, thinking about this globally. And I think there is there is a principle that I know being used in both the environmental space and I know it's used in internet security, uh, which is that you should think globally, but act locally. And I think that's a really good motto for us as we're thinking about addressing these challenges that you should always be a global perspective in what you're doing because the thing that you're working with is a global infrastructure. It is a global society that we're trying to interact with. So to think globally while you're doing these things locally is extremely important. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. Dave. Thank you. I'll try to be brief. I know um, addressing at least uh, the one question that was addressed to me. Um, how does a provider kind of operate and comply in this like web of conflicts of laws? I think is a really important question and one of our kind of like fundamental principles is that we should not be forced to violate one country's laws in order to comply with another's. That's just a really critical point. And there's obviously a lot of concern about US laws in, in our world and understand that. One thing that's fortunate about US law is that it does account for the ability to challenge a demand where it conflicts, where there's a true conflict with another country's laws. It's called a comedy challenge, not the kind that makes you laugh, but it ends in ITY. Um, and we do report every six months on all of the cross-border requests that we get. That's something we include in our transparency reports. And I think that transparency generally is, is a kind of the path toward accountability across the board. And um, ensuring that users are notified when their data is requested, ensuring that everyone understands what authorities can and cannot do. Um, and ultimately, either the government or provider community um, putting up statistics every every six months or more often to kind of show what is actually happening can dispel a lot of concerns and myths. Uh, really quickly on the appropriate forum, certainly um, we need broader participation. The OECD did get some things right and then they brought a lot of people to the table that haven't sat at that table before together, um, including you know privacy voices and data um, regulators, um, DPAs, and you know law enforcement, national security folks with some input from civil society and business. I think we need more input. Um, we also need more multilateral agreements generally, because if you start counting up how long these bilateral agreements take, it will take years to cover all of the countries in the world unless we start going more multilaterally. So that's one of the, I think you know, it's time for the governments to kind of start rolling up their sleeves and um, get to work on that. Thanks, Dave. My yes, so maybe I'll, um comment on the question on the geopolitics. Um, I mean, it appears that geopolitics is the flavor of the day a bit everywhere, not only the telecommunication sector, we may talk about electronic vehicles or other things. There is a little bit of uh, this uh, at the moment in the world. Um, what I would like to emphasize though is that uh, from our perspective as a private sector, um, well, association representing the private sector, it is a very thin line between promoting competitiveness of a certain region and, and being outright protectionist. So I think that it's a very fine line to walk. And for like any industry or any, any uh, private sector um, organization in this, well, in, in this globe today, most of us do need a global market for some purpose. And I was in the beginning uh, making comments about 
the increasing third-party engagement for uh, cross-border uh, data traffic, for example, with the with the new uh, developments in the telecom industry. So, um, so I think that that's good to keep in mind. Maybe just quickly on the institutional framing. It's good to have discussions. It's good to see how we can develop these common principles. And here I'm not trying to uh, push for any European model, but, but there are then regions such as Europe who already have regulations in place on many of these things, who are first movers, whether it's good or bad. So it's also then very important from our perspective not to duplicate or create something, you know, that, that will be then an, another layer on top of it. But if it's principles, if it's things like that, we, I think, can fully endorse that. Thank you. Thank you, Marit. Jakob. Yeah, I, I very much like what, what Carl said, think globally, but act locally. Uh, I think that um, that is the vision for, you know, for every local company in all our uh, nations. Um, but if you want to incentivize uh, these local companies to place their data, for example, in a cloud, as I said uh, before, share it, let it flow globally, then you need to give these companies also assurances that uh, data cannot be accessed. Uh, and uh, David highlighted it. I think there are conflicts uh, between different laws at the moment that make it very difficult for cloud providers to really adhere to one or the other. But in the end, they need to. And so the solution at the moment that some nations are going is to say, well, let's um, find frameworks uh, that for highest sensitive data prevent uh, data access. And if that means uh, that only a local cloud provider should be the main uh, um, company dealing with the data, then that is the solution that at the moment is working. Uh, I think coming back to uh, Raul's point, um, of course, me, I'm very much looking at the EU-US focus, but you're fully right. Um, and that goes in the question of global fora. These, these rules should, if possible, be harmonized as much as possible. And there should be fora where governments get together and uh, really outline what they are doing. Because, um, you know, rules on foreign ownership, data localization, I talked a little about Europe. These rules exist in the US as well, and I'm sure they exist also in other nations. So I think coming together, um, making kind of a mapping and best practices um, of uh, what is happening on the legislative side uh, across nations, not only in the EU US, should be the way ahead. Because in the end, ultimately, both consumers and enterprises but, uh, uh, and companies like such as myself want legal certainty. I think that's the most important. Uh, and, and if we get that by, um, you know, harmonizing these rules uh, globally, then we can also uh, enable um, global data flows and not only uh, local data flows. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks really for being here. We finished almost on time. Uh, all that's left for me is to, uh, is to summarize. Um, which I won't do because we ran out of time. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, really. Um, what, just to note, uh, on, on the account of last words, some of the things we were talking about how we operationalize this concept of data free flows with trust. And I think we, we drew out quite a few good lessons here that are worth mentioning, um, even if it's just telegraphically and without uh, really any um, uh, effort here to, to be uh, comprehensive. Uh, the value of partnerships you've highlighted, the value of having all stakeholders at the table, which includes making sure that forums are open for stakeholder participation and for that global inclusiveness that we all talk about when we talk about data. Um, uh, it also needs to happen at the policymaking uh, level. Um, when we are talking about um, technology and, and, and how technology can actually help uh, in some of these issues, um, thinking about encryption, thinking about transparency, thinking about uh, interoperability, both at the technological level, but also at the levels of policies. Um, when we think about what are good regulations, what are um, good policy uh, principles uh, upon which we start acting, um, you've all mentioned, um, again, thinking interoperably, um, having a risk-based uh, uh, approach, creating safe spaces for dialogue and for sharing uh, best practices. Um, and then when we talk about um, the role of business, uh, I think it was very clear um, not, to, not to put business at the middle uh, around some of these um, ping pong of uh, jurisdictional legal uh, policy conversations, but really make sure that business at the table, uh, is, is at the table, that all stakeholders are at the table, um, and we think holistically um, and, and uh, in a multi-stakeholder fashion uh, about the normative uh, principle-based conversations, but then that make sure that those trickle down at the local level into clear implementation, 
uh, into clear capacity building. Um, so that's what I really captured, and, and, and it's really a telegraphic summary. There's a lot more that we can, we can say about this. Um, there's a lot of resources that we put onto the website of this session, including some of the ICC papers, uh, but also a, a number of the papers and, and reference, uh, reference material that speakers have mentioned today. I do encourage you to take a look. Uh, we're still here until the end of the forum, um, so come to the ICC basis booth and find us, and, and we can share some of that uh, with you as well. Uh, so I wish you all uh, a good rest of your debates and a huge thanks to my panelists, both online and here on the panel. Um, thank you and have a great rest of your day.